I'm on the mend though. I mean, I can take certain things and uh, Dayquil just um, really messes with him. It's part of having Tourette's. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm on the mend though. I mean, and when we hear, I can him, take certain things and uh, and we're live and I'm going to go ahead and put us on the stream. It says that we're connecting, we're thinking, we're thinking, and maybe I turned too many things off. Let's charge that. I had to turn the server back on. Okay. So good evening. It is Friday, November 4th, and we are just almost at the top of the hour. And if you can hear the sound of my voice, please do let me know in the chat room. You are here just in time for that show about film and television trivia, Matinee Minutia. Let me know if you can hear me in the chat room. Doot -doot 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 -doot. Oh, I'm getting some uh, sound effects that aren't supposed to be there. Let's see if oh, I... I couldn't tell if that was you or me. Let's see. Oh, maybe it's you, but I won't point fingers. Hey, Tommy sure. said he hears you. I, oh, I couldn't tell if that was you or me. Let's oh, see. I know what oh, the problem is. I gotta, I gotta fix my sound here. Okay. Whether it's cold or whether it's hot, we've got to have weather, whether or not. Oh, did you just make that up? No, I was quoting um, Fibber McGee and Molly. Oh. You know that old, one of those old radio shows? Yeah. Mom and Dad used to have audio cassettes of them and we'd list them in car trips. Oh, how cute. <laughs> they were a wholesome, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> all right so they hear us apparently all righty and i could try to get closer to my microphone if that helps it already looks like it's right up your nose i know i'm making sweet love to my microphone <laughs> oh my god i i swear i have not taken any cold medication to Day. today was my detox day you can only okay. take that stuff for 24 hours <laughs> oh Myron Mar says they're expecting snow mm, out there in the well to the west of the heartland i think although uh i think the nebraska is considered part of the heartland we we are having super warm weather here i don't know what's going on but it's it was in the 70s today i think mother nature was taking some cold medication because yeah <laughs> I had the windows open. I got them open right now. Oh, well, let's see here. Well, I am recording and uh, it looks like there's some people already in the room. So I, I suppose we could no. uh, just uh, away we go. Let's start. Good evening and welcome to the beautiful historical marionette theater. This evening, we're going to discuss an early 80s drama comedy based upon a John Irving novel, novel The World According to Garp, starring Robin Williams, Glenn Close, and Mary Beth Hurd. Please take your seats. The show is about to begin. That saxophone just gets right to you there, Gertie. I didn't know you could play that. I didn't either. <laughs> she must have picked that up from an old flame. Well, Toppy, here we are at the beautiful historical marionette theater, and it's now in the 11th month of the year. Can't I don't believe it. even want to think about what's around the corner. Not going to say it. Not going to jinx myself. Well, we might as well confess our next several movies are going to be based on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you need a happy thought, you just have to look no further yeah. than that name and Well, and we do need happy thoughts. 
That's right now. Sure. Uh, we all need happy thoughts, so let's just as well. we'll get but uh, it's not crema yet. No. Um, and we got um, warm temperatures here. And uh, Byron says it's maybe going to snow soon. And Tommy up there in the North Country, we don't. Tommy, how is it over there, up there? I mean, up there, way north of here. Yeah, you, you're getting that. I mean, we were in the 70s today, Tommy. I don't know. I don't I mean, know what you guys. I, I'd have to ask if up there in Fort Maple, are they still tapping the trees or is that season over now? <laughs> it better be over. It better be over. You know, Toppy, we have been through the ringer in my house the last couple of weeks. I started a new, new job, which was my happy thought. Uh, but also our our little boy wonder. Oh, let me plug in. Our little boy wonder managed to get into something he shouldn't. And uh, it was partly our fault because being the pet parents, we feel awful that we bought him a toy that's supposed to be for chewing. Now, who would have thought a chew toy for a cat? Those sorts of things are usually for dogs and for good reason. Don't buy them, folks. Um, for, for legal reasons, I can't give you the product name or any of that, but uh, our Oh, yes, is... yes, you can. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah, that's why all, all the fine print on all dog eater eating and cat eating toys and things all say, uh, only, only use when you're watching your pet. Right. <laughs> it just felt, it just felt horrible because here's this sweet little special needs boy who is just getting used to living in our house. And then he, he swallows this part of the toy and he's hiding from us. He doesn't want to eat. And it doesn't make me feel any better because for the last three years, I've been working at home. And I'm going mm -hmm. to a job where, although fortunately I am at home every other week, I'm going to be out of the house during the day. And I just felt horrible knowing that I would have to leave with him in that state. But yeah, you, you might be in the position that a lot of pet owners are in this day and age is that they got used to their humans being at home all the time. And now here, both of you uh, are going to have to leave the house. You, I guess, may, well, it sounds like you're going to be every other week at home or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, but still, your your cats are all used to, to you being there twenty four seven. And if you know, uh, if we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, the. Uh... The season of giving thanks is coming up on us. And that's one of the things that we're thankful for is that hubby and I both left well-paying, stressful jobs for jobs that weren't maybe paying as well, but were certainly less stressful and were appreciated a lot more by our peers. So that is something that I am thankful. And uh, you heard it here first. I uh, gave thanks in advance. So Toppy, um, you know, speaking of turkey and perhaps maybe wild turkey, did I take yeah. there? Um, <laughs> is our senior showgirl in the house? I think she is. Uh, Gertie, Gertie. Yeah, I'm here, present and accounted for. Hi. <laughs> well, Madame, could you get down to center stage yeah. for us and uh, do that special thing you do? Okay. I really like the movie you guys selected tonight. I could have been in it. I should have been. I could have had Glenn Close's part. But anyways, okay, I'll, I'll introduce him. Well, there she goes. Harp is a young writer who was raised in the shadow of his radical feminist mother. 
as he settles into middle age, he begins to lose sight of the important things he's already accomplished. Will he ever escape the legacy of his mother's manifesto? Will he rekindle the spark in his marriage? Grab a sweater. We're headed to the big house on the coast. It's time for The World According to Garp, starring Robin Williams and Glenn Close, based upon a novel by John Irving. Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Take it away, fellas. What do you get when you take a dash of the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies and a smidgen of screaming. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. Okay, and uh, as we mentioned in the last episode, tonight's episode is a listener request. (laughs) Yes, our dear friend uh, Tommy there of the great white north, Fort Maple, wrote into us and said that he wanted to bring up this movie, this gem from the 80s. And as you heard, it's based on a John Irving novel. Boy, it seems like a long time ago that this movie came out Uh, well it was a long time ago (laughs) what am i saying but it was 1982 dj so what was happening in history back then okay in 1982 ma bell at&t agreed to divide itself into 22 subdivisions they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar late night with david letterman made its debut on nbc The first guest was Bill Murray, who 33 years later would be the last guest David Letterman had on. In 82, a groundbreaking ceremony for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was held in Washington, D.C., and a crowd of over 100,000 attended the first day of the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hmm. Over 11 million people attended the fair during its six-month run. Also in 82, the Weather Channel. Not just your evening news now. The Weather Channel, a 24-hour dedicated weather news channel, began in the U.S. Also in 82, Steven Spielberg and Tobe Hooper's horror film collaboration, Poltergeist, was released. And in Orlando, Florida, Walt Disney World opened the second largest theme park, Epcot Center, to the public for the first time. In 82, car designer John DeLorean was arrested for selling white snow, China snow, cocaine to undercover FBI agents, and he was later found not guilty on the grounds of entrapment. Hmm. Michael Jackson (laughs) released Thriller in 82, and it was the biggest selling album of all time then. Is that record still hold, do you think? I think it's pretty high up there. Something else, you know, might have tipped the scale, but it held it for a long time. Okay. Whew, 1982. Lardy McLeod, Lord, that's a long time ago. But we did have some uh, celebrities you might know that was born in 82. Pete Goodigig. Buttigig. <laughs> DJ, say his name for me. Boutigeg. Boutigeg. Uh, he was a Indianapolis mayor and then a presidential candidate. And uh, he is now the U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Don't know how that happened. Don't know what his qualifications are for that, but that's his job. Anyways, Adam Lambert, uh, singer and songwriter and actor, was born in 82. So is Kat Von D. Mexican-born tattoo artist and reality TV star. <laughs> Maybe you guys know him, but I don't know. Uh, Constance Wu, the actress from ABC's Fresh Off the Boat. That was a TV series in between 2015 and 2020. Danica Patrick, she's a race car driver, breaking the barrier there. Kelly Clarkson, uh, American Idol singer. And Kristen Dunst, actress, you'll know her from 
Later, man. Leanne Rhymes, another singer, and Nicki Minaj, another singer, rap artist. They were all born in 82. Hey, and uh, just revisiting some of the births there, Pete Buttigieg was actually one of the first openly gay candidates for presidency. So he yeah. won the um, the role in the cabinet as Secretary of Transportation in recognition of his uh, campaign to run for presidency. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows why people are chosen for these places? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think he's had any uh, experience in transportation whatsoever. But I mean, whatever. Have you ever, have you ever been to Indiana? You, you can't get around walking. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so 1982, World According Garp comes out mm-hmm. in July. What else was in the theaters? Okay. So the silver screen brought us this story when it was adapted to the film. And as Toppy said, it was released in the summer of 82. Now it was uh, not really uh, far from the top. It was number 27. So it actually did pretty good, especially for a film adapted uh, from a novel. And it brought in 29.7 million. The top of the box office in 82, however, included Steven Spielberg's film, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Which it had, might have made a, a little bit more money than our movie tonight. Oh, I think <laughs> perhaps. It, got, it had, uh, of course, Henry Thomas, Drew Barrymore, and D. Wallace. Let's see. Now, uh, number two was the beginning of the uh, Indiana Jones uh, franchise. It was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh my God, that came out the same year as E.T.? Did, and of course that starred uh, Harrison Ford and Karen Allen. And then in number three was uh, Sylvester Stallone in the the, uh, the the second sequel that maybe didn't need to be made. Rocky Three brought in $124 million. And of course that starred Sylvester Stallone and Carl Weathers, who more in more recent years has been in... Um, some of the uh, Star Wars uh, franchise films on the Disney Plus service there. Okay. I think Carl Weathers, who was his opponent in the first two movies, I think he became his trainer in this movie. Oh, I think you're right. Because Burgess Meredith had passed away. Right. I think so. Now, uh, doing slightly better than our film tonight, at number 26 was Tron, which starred Jeff Bridges and Bruce Boxleitner of a future Babylon 5 fame. Yep. Hey, want to feel old? Hey, they've already made remade this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, the next movie. Oh, DJ, mm-hmm. I love this movie. So that brought in 29.7 million. And then just uh, a rung below in the box office at number 28, giving you an idea of what the competition was, was Victor Victoria with Julie Andrews, oh. James Garner, and that brought in 28.2 million. Why haven't we done that one yet? Hmm. That is certainly a definite possibility. I know, wasn't the Broadway version that was done uh, had Liza Minnelli? Oh, God. She, she did it? I, I think that there was at least one production on, on Broadway that had Liza in it. Wow. I just would have thought maybe she, well, I don't know. It could have. I don't remember, but I do know it did get on Broadway. But I think Julie Andrews was in the Broadway. Hmm. Wasn't she? I think Mar- Maren Gertz may come to the rescue here. I, You know, it's hard to say because I know there were a few things that Julie Andrews did on Broadway, but then somebody else was cast in the film role. And I know that that was the case for My Fair Lady, for example. Yeah, but in this case, Victor Victoria, the movie came out and then they made the play, the uh, a musical on Broadway. Oh, well, Toppy, before we talk about the magician of the film, the director, because uh, the marionette has been a splendid venue of many things, including Magician X and the directors considered the mis- magician and uh also a, a company of burlesque performers like Gertie. Yes. Hey! I, okay. <laughs> uh, get those knee eyes on. Uh, let's go ahead and play the trailer from this film in 82. Mm-hmm. 
babies floating around in the screen. Garp. Garp. Garp? Yes, garp. Sounds like a fish. When I get older, losing my head, many years from now. Hey, Garp, you want to play? Yes. Not tonight. I have a headache. Every night you have a headache. <laughs> My name is T.S. Garp. What's T.S. stand for? Terribly sexy. I used to be terribly shy, but I changed. If I'd been out till quarter to three, would you lock the door? Now make it easy on yourself. Don't be a baby, Duncan. Say da-da. <laughs> Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? I hate to use a corny line like this, but haven't I seen you before? You like football? Oh, yeah, I used to watch it quite a bit. Well, you might have seen me. I was a tight end with the Philadelphia Eagles. Send me a postcard, drop me a line, staging point of view. T.S. Garp, not the bastard son of Jenny Fields. We're going to be safe here. Indicate precisely what you mean to say. You're sincerely wasting away. We are civilized people, and civilized people obey rules. You have one hell of a way of making converts to civilization. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? What does the TS stand for? Terribly sad. Used to be terribly sexy, but, but it changed. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. T.S. Eliot had the same problem. Anyways. <laughs> you know, Tapia, I think that trailer um, highlighted one of the best parts of this film. John Lithgow in this film, and uh, he played a character that was a post-operative transsexual. And unlike a lot of films of that era, I didn't see it as a genuinely comedic role. He, he actually played the part just as a woman, which... I thought was very refreshing, especially from being 1982. Well, I have to agree. Um, it's a remarkable uh, performance in a remarkable part that uh, his part in the movie had very little, if anything, to do with the fact that uh, he was a transsexual. And you really... I mean, I hope most people, I did certainly, and I think most people did, you really like her in this movie. Well, I guess him, but but it's a, it's a remarkable thing for that early in 82. And yeah, 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 absolutely. So the director, mm -hmm. his name was George Roy Hill. He started out pretty much acting. Yeah. Uh, way back in 47, he was in a production of Bernard George Bernard Shaw's The Devil's Disciple. Later on, he had a leading role in The Raven of Wicklow in 48. And uh, in the USA, uh, he uh, got on Broadway and toured with Margaret Webster's Shakespeare Repertoire Company. He was in Richard the uh, the Second, the Taming of the Shrew, and he was in this Creditors with B. Arthur of all people. But he eventually started acting on television. This is what it have been in the era when TV did live, uh, hour long or two hour long uh, productions. That uh, such as the Lux Video Theater or uh, or uh, Craft Theater or Playhouse 90. He was in acting in a lot of those live productions in early TV history. But Hill kind of got it into his head. He wanted to be a director. And he started out uh, directing some theater productions and eventually made it onto Broadway, producing a lot of productions uh, in, uh, in, on Broadway. And in 1962, Hill began directing feature movies in Hollywood. 
And his first one was Period of Adjustment in 62. Uh, that starred Jane Fonda, Jim Hutton. And his first movie directing was a box office success. Always a good thing when you're starting out. <laughs> so he was uh, doing really good. And he began in just a year later, his own production company called Pan Arts Company, which is the company that produced uh, the world according to Garp. So it was that company existed all the way into the 80s, starting in 1963. So listen to these blockbusters, folks. These are the movies Hill went on to direct. And they're all, they're huge. Listen to this. He did Hawaii in 66. He did Thoroughly Modern Millie in 67. He did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 69. Slaughterhouse Five in 72. The Sting in 73. He won, which uh, is a movie that won seven Academy Awards. And uh, he won Best Director for The Sting. Well-deserved. He went on to do The Great Waldo Pepper in 75, Slapshot in 77, A Little Romance in 79, and in 82, he did The World According to Garp, which, by the way, was Glenn Close's film debut. I did not know that, uh, but yes, Glenn Close's film debut. Uh, uh, his last movie, Joy, George Roy Hill, his last movie, was Funny Farm <laughs> in 1988 with Chevy Chase. And after he retired from directing, he uh, taught drama at Yale for many years. So a long life. What incredible uh, series of movies he directed. And among those, Funny Farm is one of my favorites because you can't get much funnier than having to pay the neighbors to be nice to you to sell your house. <laughs> mm. Mm. Now, Myron Gertz wrote something interesting in the chat room, and I need Myron to elaborate a little, but she wrote, just an as, as a side, just as an aside, this movie was made for us rather than them. I'm not sure. I think she's talking about Garp. She may be talking about Victor Victoria, but Maren Gertz, write a little bit more down. Tell us what you mean, because that's an interesting comment. So the cast, mm -hmm. DJ. Okay. We'll dip our toes into that pool, and then in a little bit, we're going to take a, uh, a trip over to the snack bar for our intermission. But uh, Mr. Robin Williams who played our leading man in this film. His name was T.S. Garp. Now, Robin Williams was born in Chicago, the Windy City, and he was a descendant of former Mississippi governor. I didn't know that. His father was an executive at Ford Motor Company in nearby Indiana. The World According to Garp was only his second film. The first was it, just two years before Popeye in 1980 with Shelley Duvall. And uh, he was fresh from the fourth season run of Mork and Mindy when he did The World According to Garp. Well, uh, Robin Williams would appear in five more films over the next five years, including a personal favorite, Moscow on the Hudson, in mm. 84 with Elia Baskin, and a film that we've discussed right here just the other year in 87. He did Good Morning Vietnam with uh, Forrest Whitaker and Bruno Kirby, based upon... Uh, uh, the, a true story there. And uh, in the 90s, Williams continued to act in such films as Awakenings in 1990 with Robert De Niro and John Hurd. And in 91, he appeared in Hook, a Peter Pan story with Julia Roberts, Justin Hoffman, and Jane Maggie Smith before she was in the Harry Potter films. And in 93. But she looked the same age. That I, movie. Know. <laughs> I, I swear to God, 
She's ageless. Ageless. It's like that, uh, you know, when Harry met Sally conversation, I'll have what she's having. Yeah. Uh, in 93, Robin Williams appeared in Mrs. Doubtfire with Sally Fields and Pierce Brosnan. And uh, in the new century, Williams began to branch out into non-comedic roles, such as One Hour Photo in 2002. Creepy. Yes. I don't know what I felt about it. I don't know. And in 07, he did a film with uh, Freddie Highmore, who was the star of the uh, more recent Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, as well as that really good movie that we discussed with Johnny Depp, Finding Neverland. Freddie Highmore was the youngest boy in that. He did a film called August Rush, and uh, it was sort of a, uh, a modern, ap- ap- a- 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 modern adaptation of Oliver Twist. It was a young boy who had a gift for music, and he was an orphan, but he used his gift to try to help him find his birth parents. So uh, throughout the course of his career, Williams won numerous awards, including an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role in Goodwill Hunting. Mm. That uh, introduced us to the likes of Matt Damon and Ben F., like I do believe. Yep. And uh, he also won six Golden Globe Awards, including Best Actor, motion picture musical or comedy for his roles in good morning vietnam from 87 the fisher king in 91 and mrs doubtfire in 93 along with special golden globe award for vocal work in motion picture for his role as the genie in aladdin in 92 and the cecil b demille award in 05 he also received two primetime emmy awards two screen actors guild awards and five grammy awards as of his passing in 2014, Williams had 111 acting credits. Wow, wow, wow. And in more recent years, uh, at the time of his passing, he was suffering from depression and alcoholism and was misdiagnosed with Parkinson's, which was later determined to be a disfiguring disease called Lewy body, which is uh, involving development of dementia. Yeah, and... Uh... I remember there were rumors that he committed suicide. He did not commit suicide. And, um, or did he? No. Did I, I, did I just pull that out of my ass? Uh, well, I, I, I'll use a little bit of aerosol here because um, he, he did take his, uh, he took his own life in fear of the dementia developing. Okay. Because in many cases, it's not, um, you know, re- recoverable. You can treat it, you can maintain it but you can't prevent it from advancing. So, all right, we are going to step out here to the lobby. Where Gertie is whipping up some treats. And uh, we're going to listen to an interview with our favorite Texas morning news host, Bobby Wyant, who had an occasion to interview Mr. Robin Williams Uh, about the world according to Garp. Yay, good old Bobby. We are here to talk about the world according to Garp, and you are Garp, and this is no Mork from Ork. No, ma'am. I wonder, Robin, isn't it pretty risky, though, for your kind of, of performer to do this kind of thing where audiences, if they don't know anything about Garp, they come in, they're looking for Robin Williams, and they find something different? Hopefully that's a positive experience. You know, like, um, it's, I know, uh, the film isn't just me. I mean, there's such a power to the film, I think, that they'll be pleased by it. I mean, there's such a positive life force to it. I think it'll. I think people walk away feeling very good about it, having not read the book or not knowing what it's about. It still has a good. It's a good story. Why did you see yourself in this role? Because of um, initially, the first thing that really hooked me in was his wrestling. Because I loved wrestling so much in high school, collegiate wrestling, which is different than like professional wrestling. People going, no, no. But collegiate wrestling is really an incredibly disciplined sport. Some people say it's kind of sadomasochistic, but it's it's actually it's a wonderful combination of training, endurance, you know, mental agility. It's a, people who are wrestlers are a very bizarre breed of people, and that's what originally hooked me into it. They're usually very individualistic. They usually um, because no one comes to see your wrestling matches. Usually, it's, you're in a small, steamy room. It's always bizarre. I don't know if we can put this on TV, but. I used to have my, my own one of my mother and father come see me wrestle once. And every time I was my way, I was winning, but every so often the coach would yell, crotch ride, crotch ride. No, mom's going, no, that's lovely. 
<laughs> but it's a wonderful sport. I mean, I really loved it. It's a great, it gives you a great feeling about yourself. And that's what hooked me into it. And after that, as I got further into the book, his soul and heart is incredible. He's such a sensitive, emotionally strong man that I really just got hooked into it. Did you ever have a chance to discuss Garp with John Irving? Yeah. He, at first, he, he wasn't coming to the see, see the shooting. Then he came to see a couple of dailies, and he really hooked into the film. He, he would sometimes come up to me, and he'd outline certain passages in the book. If, that he, I would just read. It was like reading a little passage of the Bible before you, I shot a scene, but I would read a scene. Just because there's so much narrative in the book, the narrative helps you really. For scenes where you had no dialogue, he would, it would help you just kind of prepare yourself for this when you have nothing to say at all, just to have a whole mental attitude that made it come to life. Does Irving like the movie? I think so very much, which is a great compliment, I think. I think he feels very positive about it, which makes me feel like, okay. Hey, Mr. Tolstoy, how do you like that play? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> hey, Mr. Melville, how is that? That's some fish, huh? <laughs> Robin, this uh, is a very stressful time in your life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're, we're all, um, you know, we're all pulling for you to, to get through this. Um, how do you get through such stressful times? What, what do you, what is your strength? How do you get through it? Well, my wife, she helps a lot. She's a real grounding influence. I have a ranch, a cattle ranch up in Napa, California, which is real wonderful. That helps a lot. It's hard to be real stressful when you have 600 acres going and lots of owls going, who are you? And you're out there and it's just, it's so calm that you, you lose. There's no pressures there for me. And when you're on the back of a mule and the mule is going, what show business? <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. That helps. Um, running sometimes, swimming, and good friends, really good friends. Christopher Reeve's a good friend. He helps a lot. By mm -hmm. having good friends, you, know, you, you can get through anything. Him and all my friends, they really help incredibly. Mm. Oh, Lordy, we lost him too soon. And I, I just want to take a moment before we continue on with the discussion to say, that Robin Williams is one of my personal favorite actors. He had the talent, the caliber of such that there's several movies that just personally speak to me. And um, one of those was Awakenings that I mentioned previously there in 1990. This was a, a story about a group of people who were all basically in a catatonic state. They had gone through an illness and there was no cure for at the time. And this spoke to my father personally, because in his youth, he survived rheumatic fever and that left him with a learning disability. So my father was never able to read above, oh, I want to say a sixth grade level. And, you know, as, as just as a person, but more as a man in those days that left him scarred. And Awakenings was a film that spoke to him. And many years later, when we lost him before his time, uh, a Robin Williams film helped me through that experience. It was What Dreams May Come with Annabella Sciorra. Yeah. That was a film about a man who dealt with the loss of his wife and children. Well, his children first and then his wife. And it was about the afterlife. And it was just such a beautiful film. The, the original story was based on um, the, uh, the wife being a cook, a chef. And mm -hmm. when they translated it to the screen, she became an artist because they were able to bring her the world of her paintings to life through the cinema. So those were right. two examples of Robin Williams films that have spoken to me personally. So nice. talk we have well um yeah before before we go on i just want to get back to Marin gertz and her comment she said just an aside this movie was made for us rather than them and <clears throat> when last we left i i asked her if she was talking about victor victoria or garp she was talking about garp and she says not sure exactly what you'd currently call that group but think we referred to ourselves as freaks and she says, maybe we were the super cool or the hip. And the last thing she writes is dementia is evil. And uh, that's talking about, um, I think this 
group of women um, that were being cared for at the home of um, the ancestral home of, of Garp and his mother, this beautiful home by the ocean, where she was clearly caring for a variety of women. They were all women with a variety of, of complex problems and because she was a nurse and that, that was her life mission. So <clears throat> thank you for that, Maren. So we'll get back to the cast, right? Uh, Mary that. Beth Hurt. Mm -hmm. She played Helen Holm and uh, she was Garp's wife in the movie. Well, she was born in Iowa and she went to the University of Iowa. By the way, so did Gene Wilder and Ashton Kutch Kutcher. Mm -hmm. And World According to Garp was their fourth film. Uh, just prior to that, she was in A Change of Seasons. That was with Shirley MacLaine and Anthony Hopkins. Right after Garp, she did Daryl with Michael McKeon and Barrett Oliver. Um, and if you remember back, uh, she made her film debut in a very unusual Woody Allen movie because it wasn't a comedy. Not even a little bit. It was called Interiors from 1978 and she was joey the second of three sisters dealing with the emotional fallout of a family's disintegration after their mother's descent into mental illness uh i liked interiors by woody allen but it wasn't usual uh she uh, got a bafta award for that role but she was also in chilly scenes of winter in 79 Garp in 82, and she was in The Age of Innocence uh, by Martin Scorsese, and uh, she was, um, she played Gene Seberg in a voiceover in Mark Rappaport's 1995 documentary from the journals of Gene Seberg. So she's been quite lauded uh, for what she's been doing. She was nominated for the Independent Spirit uh, award for best supporting female for her performance in the dead girl a, night, a 2006 movie and she was nominated for a drama desk award and at, earned an obie award for her role in crimes of the heart in 81 and uh, she's also in 75 won uh, the Clarence Derwent Award for Best Supporting Female for her role in the off-Broadway off production of uh, the play Love for Love. And uh, she certainly, certainly turned in a good performance in GARP. Okay, so now we're going to uh, talk about the uh the uh supporting role the kind of a leading lady because she had a lot of scenes she's very important she was on the screen before robin williams glenn close she played jenny fields his mama and the head nurse there uh, miss glenn close was born in connecticut and when she was 13 her father opened a clinic in what was then known as the belgian congo now it's the Democratic, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo and ran it for 16 years. During most of that time, the close children lived alternately in Africa and at boarding schools in Switzerland, as you do. Close grandfather, Edward Bennett Close, was once married to Marjorie Merriweather Post. Yes, that post, heiress to the Post serial fortune. Cookie wow <laughs> cookie crisp anyone <laughs> and in 1984 she became the third actor to receive an oscar emmy and tony nomination in the same calendar year well these were for her roles in the big chill something about amelia and uh, the real thing respectively a relatively late starter. By, by the way, do yeah. we do we remember what it was about something about Amelia? What was what was Amelia's problem? What do we remember? Anybody? Just curious. Mm -hmm. Well, we will uh, pull the chat room there for that. I think it was a TV movie. 
Oh, perhaps so. And uh, as we were saying, Glenn Close was a relative late starter for film. Uh, she was already 35 when she made her debut in the world, according to Garp. Her next film was The Big Chill in 83. That's where I first saw her, The Big Chill. Mm, with Tom Berenger and William Hurt. And Close would appear in six films over the next five years, including Fatal Attraction in 87 with Michael Douglas. Now, full disclosure, I've never seen that film. Huh. I'm only aware of what happens with a certain family pet and a cooking pot. Okay. Don't tell Tommy. No. <laughs> I well, anyways, Tommy <laughs> probably knows. They probably couldn't make that uh, the, these days. Uh, but there's parts of the world, according to Garp, that couldn't be made these days either. Uh, in 2014, Glenn Close revealed in a Hollywood Reporter interview that when she was seven years old, her father and the whole family joined an ultra conservative religious cult, the Moral Rearmament or MRA. Good Lord. Yes. The cult led by an anti-intellectual evangelical fundamentalist. Oh, how many <laughs> Wait a minute. An anti, anti-intellectual <clears throat> evangelical fundamentalist. It sounds like he was against educating women. Okay. Uh, if fundamentalist Re- Pennsylvania reverend named Frank Buckman. He sounds like a winner. Mm -hmm. had been founded during the 30s to oppose the prospect of America entering the war against Nazism. Would they want us to lay down? Well, there were a lot of people that felt that way back Mm -hmm. then. Close said that while in the cult, you basically weren't allowed to do anything or you were made to feel guilty about any unnatural desire. If you talk to anybody who was in a group that basically dictates how you're supposed to live, and what you're supposed to say, and how you're supposed to feel from the time you're seven till the time you're 22. It has a profound impact on you. Yeah, it's called a cult. Uh, That's a cult right there. That's the definition. You know, I read recently something about uh, Angela Lansbury saved her daughter from the clutches of uh, uh, Charles Manson because she moved her family to England at the time. Let's see. Uh, let's. It's something you have to consciously overcome because all your trigger points are wrong. Yeah. And as a young adult, she performed in the group up with people. Oh, I knew a few people that were in that group. They were, uh, they were uh, annoyingly positive. I. Aj. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh my God. You said it. The cult's traveling performance offshoot organization that was designed as a right-wing counterpoint to the hippie movement until she broke away from both the MRA and up with people in 1970. What, did she get off the bus and, you know, find a cab or something? Uh, So as of 2018, Close has appeared in three films that were nominated for the Best Picture Oscar. The Big Chill in 83, Fatal Attraction in 87, and Dangerous Liaisons in 88. Each time she has appeared in a Best Picture nominee, she was also Oscar name- nominated for her, 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 for her performance in the film. And as of 2021, Glenn Close has the most Oscar nominations, which is eight, without a win amongst living actors of any gender. To date, she has 94 acting credits. Pretty awesome career. Uh, this was my first viewing of the movie. I don't know how I just never saw it. I just never saw it. And uh, Robin Williams was a bit of a name at this time because <clears throat> he was well known from Mork, which was one of those TV shows I couldn't stand. But anyways, just because it, it just was so stupid. I don't know. Um, but uh, I remember being, I remember how this movie was promoted. And it, there was a lot of talk about Robin Williams in it. And I don't know what I thought this movie was about. But I got to tell you. I wasn't expecting what I saw. Um, I wasn't expecting it at all. 
uh, I liked it. Um, the journey these characters go through are like, it's pretty wackadoodle and mm -hmm. it's very serious. And there are some serious consequences. Um, I, I, I just had no idea, no idea uh, that this movie was that heavy. Um, but it breezes by. Uh, it's quite well made. And uh, I, I definitely would recommend it. I, people should see this movie. So this um, is actually maybe the second time I've watched this. A co-worker gifted me a copy of this a few years back when we were going through some difficult times at home. And after watching this film, you certainly do pick up on more things as you do with a lot of films with each subsequent viewing. So it, it made a lot more sense to me the second time around because you realize that, you know, some of the, uh, well, shall I say wronged women who are featured in this film, they're basically part of a cult and they continue to appear at pivotal times in the main character's life. You know, he's, he's competing with the reputation of his mother as a radical feminist author. And he's just trying to get by as a little guy. He's just trying to be a writer and everyone thinks of him as, you know, the nurse's bastard child. Yeah, but isn't it true that he's like, you know, he has many interests, wrestling, but he wants to be a writer. Although I think he arrives at that idea just because a girl, a girl he likes, likes the idea that she's, that he's a writer anyways, mm -hmm. but he does <clears throat> work at it. And then he's, he's written, he wrote a short story about his mother and gave it to her to read to kind of maybe approve. And she says, I don't want you writing this story about me. I want to write about my own life. And then she starts, she writes a book that becomes incredibly popular mm -hmm. and influential. And, uh, you know, here's her son who's been trying to write and get published. And he does, you know, but, but nothing like the success his mother had with this one particular book anyways interesting dynamic there but i would definitely recommend this film also you you'll have to track it down because um it's it's not available on many services i did find it was available on hbo for streaming uh it's also oddly enough if you go to youtube you can rent it for three bucks oh okay yeah. By the way, I want to talk about this one thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to spoil the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there are some actions characters take in this movie that lead to dire, terrible, tragic consequences. Uh, and it involves cheating on their spouse. This is, movie is a bit of a period piece. Uh, it starts out after, well, right along, well, before World War II and then after. DJ, did I imagine this or did this really happen? Isn't it true that Robin, although Robin Williams' character Garp was led into a rage when he found out about his wife's dalliance with the younger man mm -hmm. don't we see a scene where he does the same thing to his wife I am, don't we see that i am so glad that you bring that up because um i, I get i have a feeling that as the film runs its course and they they go through that those traumatic events they're brought back together of course and it's it's not depicted on screen, but I'm wondering if they do have a, uh, you know, a coming around on that because he was accused of having an affair and she felt, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. 
And so, of course. Okay. My, my memory is just a bit different. I'm not saying you're wrong. And mm -hmm. maybe I'm misremembering, but I didn't know she knew about his little fling. Well, I think that, um, see, what happened is there's a scene where they're in the bedroom and she's grading one of her students' papers because she's a, she's a professor at the college. And this happens to be the paper of the young man who has his eye on her. Yeah. However, um, her husband laying next to her in his uh, Robin Williams is, is talking about, um, what is it? Uh, regrets perhaps. And, uh, he had just taken home the babysitter and his wife said, you know, did basically, did you put the moves on the babysitter? Okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, you know, she, she had every, uh, I'm sure that she believed that he had already been unfaithful. And even if we didn't see it, I'm pretty sure that it happened. Well, it was strongly suggested. I mean, there was a shot. He pulls over in the car on a deserted street and they turn, he stops the car. He turns the engine off. And, you know, what did they do? Well, I mean, I think we can assume mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, had a little uh, nookie nookie. Yeah. yeah. Hank and Peggy. Now, what are we to make of this is, is what I'm interested in mm -hmm. because one of the big messages of the movie are these women who are so tragically damaged by the things that men did to them. Mm -hmm. And well, what am I trying to say? This is complicated. It is complicated. Uh, she, uh, Robin William, uh, I mean, Garp does this thing that perhaps lead to his wife's thinking, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, that kind of thing. But his rage when he finds this out, and, and he, he's done the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. But he is in a rage, and this rage leads to a terrible tragedy. What are we to think of that? What are we to think of that? It's men are beasts. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it is, it, it's difficult to analyze to a point, but I, I also think that, you know, she was not any more in the right or the wrong by doing what she did, because as she understood it, her marriage had already been violated. So, but I think moreover, more importantly, the overall message to, of this film, to me at least, is, um, you know, you need to appreciate what you have before you lose it, because many yeah. of us don't understand that what we have is not our right. We've, we have simply somehow come across our circumstances and we have been gifted these opportunities so don't look a gift horse in the mouth and certainly if you have a good relationship with somebody it's all about honesty and communication because um, you're just going to shoot yourself in the foot and you're going to wonder how it is that you had it so good before and you may not ever find that again I think you're right, DJ. I think what this movie really is, is about the healing process. And that's what we see these characters in, in a <clears throat> monumental way. They've got a lot to heal from. In fact, all the women at that place on the seashore, whatever that was, some sort of... <sighs> They call they call themselves Ellen Jamesians. I think it's based on uh, a true events that there was a woman who had been raped and had her tongue cut out, mm -hmm. and they had done that to themselves as an expression of sympathy. They removed their own tongues. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
uh, folks, this has got some heavy shit in this movie, I'll tell you. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I wasn't expecting where this movie went. I, and maybe, you know, I mean, this, that makes this movie incredibly interesting. It takes you on a journey. You, you really don't, you don't know what you're getting into. Oh, um, but I do think that it's generally, I mean, about watching people heal mm -hmm. and God bless it. Wasn't <clears throat> Lithgow's performance incredible. Oh, absolutely. Because he wasn't playing a character. He was playing a person. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't matter the fact that he had, you know, once been a man. It, it was so terrific when he introduces, uh, well, when she, Roberta, introduces herself to Garp and uh, says, um, do you like football? I used to be with the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great. And and this character that John Lithgow portrays becomes so important to the whole family, really important. Um, and I love the scenes where John Lithgow interacts with Robin Williams in such an affectionate way. Uh, they hold hands, they kiss. I just love that. I, I just thought it was incredible. It was, and and uh, playing with the children too. Yes, yes, yes. By the way, I thought the kid actors were great. A lot of a lot of times when you got kids in a movie, but these kids were naturals. I don't know where they found them or whatever else they did, but these were a couple of good kid actors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all kidding aside, maybe a little bit of kidding, Toppy, without giving anything away, because we do certainly want people to see this film. There was a point where I was kept guessing as the the, the, the traumatic events continued to happen. Yeah. And it felt like it was one of those low budget horror movies. Everybody dies. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not spoiling anything. Because everybody doesn't die, but you're certainly left to wonder, God, he's he's uh, you know, he's been kicked in the guts already and he's laying on the ground. What are they going to do to him next? Yeah, this is a fully realized character that and we start to get to know this character because he's a kid when when we start the movie, he's a young boy and, and, and yet another great kid actor i don't know who he was but he was great as robin williams uh as garp as as a young kid and you know he's got such a complex history anyways i this this was not i i didn't know what i thought this movie was but it wasn't anything like mm -hmm. what i thought it was but it was a great movie mm -hmm. okay so toppy we are out here close to the lobby and uh, this is the part of our show that we refer to as our snack tray, because we're going to tell you about other things you might enjoy if you like the world according to Garp or films like it. So I'll go first. Uh, a film that I think you might enjoy, and I, I actually haven't seen this, I'm actually looking forward to seeing it, is a 2005 film that stars Jeff Daniels and Laura Linney. It follows two young boys dealing with their parents' divorce in Brooklyn in the 1980s. I'm uh, going to recommend The Squid and the Whale from 2005. Whoa, never heard of it. Interesting, though. So I'm going to recommend a 1984 movie. It's a period piece, and it's also about a family struggling, much like uh, The World According to Garp. And Somehow, I'm not exactly sure how or why, but Garp made me think of Places in the Heart, a 1984 movie starring Sally Field, Lindsay Krauss, Ed Harris, Ray Baker, Amy Madigan, John Malkovich, and Danny Glover. Uh, equally memorable there's something about it's this whole family they're not all related it's a family 
that's made of different parts, just like Garp. The, uh, the, the, they were there was a closeness between these characters, and and it wasn't all blood, you know. And that's the same in Places in the Heart. So I'm recommending if you liked Garp, you're gonna like Places in the Heart. And I think I've seen that. Uh, I do believe it's one of Sally Field's breakout roles at the time. It got her some nominations, I do believe. I want to say she won the Academy Award for that. Mm. Best Actress. I think so. I think so. Excellent. All righty. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, figure out what's coming up next on the calendar here, which will be in two weeks because we do this live on the first and third Friday of each month. And our next show will be just uh, on the cusp of the uh, American uh, giving of thanks, their Thanksgiving. So, Toppy, uh, reach up there on the shelf and uh, grab that bag of coins the magician left for us. All right. Uh, this thing, yeah, here we go. Get a coin there. Put it in the gumball machine. All right. Okay, Toppy, what do we have there? All right, next time we're starting Christmas early. I don't care what anybody, I don't care what anybody thinks. Listen, we need some Chris crema around here, so we're starting early, and <clears throat> we're going to do one Christmas. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, it's about a young man uh, who's sent to visit his uh, his his estranged father for Christmas in 1930 in New Orleans. Bay, this is why I really want to see it, based on an autobiographical short story by Truman Capote. <laughs> You'll never guess who stars in it: Henry Winkler, the Fonz, and Catherine Hepburn. Whoa! Mm -hmm. It's called One Christmas. Oh. And, uh, well, that's what we're doing next time on Matinee Minutia. Okay, so that's a, that's from the same realm as uh, uh, A Christmas Memory, also by Mr. Kinda. Cody. So I'm hoping. Interesting to follow that along. Okay. I don't know if I'm ready to see Henry Winkler and Catherine Hepburn in the same movie, but I'm game. All right, <laughs> let's do it. So long as he doesn't put his hand on her knee, I'll be fine. Good Lord. <laughs> all righty folks well before we say good night uh, could you take a look in the chat room and let us know who joined us this evening yeah i'd be glad to because folks you know you, you may be listening to the podcast but we do this show live every first and third friday of the month and there's some people that join us while we're doing it live and we're always thankful tonight we had lamont cranston we had Marn Gertz and we had our buddy pal, Tommy Hash Brown. Thank you all for coming by and supporting us. Okay, so, uh, you know, I was talking about the old days of radio earlier in the show. Toppy, um, could you, uh, you know, uh, walk us out here in the, the ways of the old days of radio? <laughs> well, nobody may understand this, but good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to univospods.net. Click the tower for audio. Enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. Joe's gone wild with Matt and Tom. Speak up. The smell cast by Tommy Smelly. Be heard. It tastes like burning with Tim and James. Unique voices in podcasting. The Shy Life Podcast with me, Paul the Shy Yeti. Univazpods.net. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take us off the stream. Doo -doo -doo.